All right, go ahead. How's everybody doing? Yeah. So I do like to talk, so I'm going to try to make this short and sweet. Uh, I had the pleasure of playing college soccer at Clemson University. In my junior year, by that time, I loved the weight room. I was the athlete my strength coach could count on. D-Love was my strength coach. And this was one morning, our whole team had gotten together and broke it down in uh, the locker room, came out, and he's like, listen, we got a couple new faces uh, joining the staff and, you know, you're just introduce yourself. She might be uh, taking over your warm-ups, a couple here and there when I'm not, you know, coming from baseball. So I'm like, okay, whatever. So we're, uh, if anyone's ever been to Clemson, you go for the Jervy parking lot to go back down into the weight room. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm the hype girl. I was that athlete that just brought the energy. And I start walking down the stairs to get into Jervy, and I just hear this girl, And I'm like, oh, damn, like, what? I walk in, and I see these six-foot-four volleyball players, and then this girl pops out of nowhere with this lightning hair just screaming, let go! And that was Stephanie Mock. Um, I had the pleasure of, you know, working with her a little bit as an athlete, um, but now she's, you know, taken on the world and become a director of strength and conditioning at Mississippi State University. And uh, I am so proud to call her a very good friend of mine. Um, and here she is, everyone. Thanks, Bill. All right, guys, it is just great to be back around people again after this COVID year, so I'm really excited to be here. And first thing I wanna do is just thank Sornex for having me. I've been able to be around, filled at our Clemson space, our Clemson weight room when I was there as an intern way back when in 2013. And actually, Phil got to do also this space with me at Mississippi State in 2018. So it's been great to work with them on multiple facilities so far. So thank you to Sornex. Thank you for my staff here for joining me. And I don't wanna take too much time to thank all these people, right? I wanna hop right into the information we have today. So what I'm gonna talk about today is constructing a high performance model from the ground up. So developing better systems, coaches, and student athletes. And in my time at Clemson, I was there for five years, uh, literally going from intern to assistant director. And then I took this position at Mississippi State. I've been there for three years, going on my fourth year at Mississippi State of the Director of Olympic Sports. So let's get right into it. So first thing I want to do is just build an identity with you guys so you have a better understanding of who I am as a strength coach and influences that I've had throughout my career. So why I do what I do, right? And a book that I read early on in my career was uh, by Lou Holtz, uh, Wins, Losses, and Lessons. And with this, it inspired me um, as an educator and a coach in four different ways. And the first one's gonna be to get buy-in, it takes enthusiasm and passion. And I hope I can get that across to you guys today as I print on, present on this information. Uh, the second thing I'm gonna talk about is just, you have to know the X's and O's inside and out. So whether it's about strength conditioning, talking with your staff, uh, with your student athletes, with your sport coaches, with administration, you need to be able to understand and speak clearly to show that you have a great understanding of it. Uh, the third thing is um, just show how much you care, right? So coming into Mississippi State, when I took over the position, uh, I was taking in a new staff. I needed to get to know them as people first um, before we got into the X's and O's. And then the last thing I'm going to really touch on today in this presentation is present and communicate information in a manner that relates to them. So that's how we're going to dive into a few different phases here today um, with building that high-performance model. So get to know us and where we started and where we're going. Intent and purpose behind everything we do. Every ball you touch. Got it? Got, Got it. it. Let's get after it today. Let's have some fun. Great to round three. One, two, three. Great different. When I hear the name Stephanie Mock, uh, I think a leader is a great way to put it. She's one that you know her presence all the time when she's in a room or even five rooms away from you, you know where she's at. She just brings it, you know? She's zero to 100, she's at 100 all the time. My parents always taught me to do something that you love and coming to work every single day here, it's something that I love so it doesn't even feel like a job. 
the way she has kind of came in here and just made it her own type of thing, making this the main weight room was, I think, one of her main goals. We didn't like the fact that you know we were separated out into two different spots when we first got here. So uh, centralizing everybody gives a lot of the teams, a lot of the athletes, a little bit more exposure to other teams or other athletes, other coaches, uh, or even support staff members that they might not have seen prior to. What helps set us apart is the family culture. On our shirts, you know, family, it's on the racks everywhere. Not only every team and every head coach has their core values that we want to help bring on also in the weight room, but we have our core values in here too, and we want everybody to feel that. Hold yourself and your teammates accountable. Consistent intent and purpose behind your training. Dominate the other 20 hours of the day. Our athletes make it really easy to get up at 5 in the morning on a Monday morning to come in here and, you know, get loud, jump around, and have fun with, with training. Stand on three, one, two, three, bam! bam. All right, so I hope that gives you guys a better understanding of me as a strength coach than also our organization and our program at Mississippi State. So uh, takeaways today that I want you guys to leave with, that's going to be important, right? Because earlier on, we, one of the speakers touched on, I want you guys to have actionable items as you leave here um, to utilize in your programs as well. So a book that I read early on in my career when I took over um, this position as the director at Mississippi State was the Checklist Manifesto. And whenever you come into a program and take it over, it can be overwhelming, right? And that's why I have in the backdrop of these slides a man overlooking a massive city, right? It can look like a lot to take over and you have to be able to organize it. And that's what that book allowed me to do is it presented me with an opportunity to create checklists to give to not only myself, but the interns, my paid interns, my graduate assistants, my assistants of, hey, this is what we need to accomplish and then moving that forward at a fast rate. Uh, the next thing I'm going to touch on is just how we organized a framework of building that high performance team. And a book actually recommended to me by uh, Tina Murray, she used to be at Louisville, um, but she recommended a high performance organization way back when, and that helped me also get the right people in the right places um, to push things forward. And then today I'm going to talk about just the process of taking over um, this high performance program from year one to going into year four, what that looks like. So I think a lot of the time people show up when things were already built, right? And I want to go through that process of giving people the tools as you're an assistant or assistant director and you take on your first director position. What does that look like? And what is that framework? I want to give you that skill set and those steps to be successful when you land that big position. So presenting information in a manner that relates to you guys. So the three phases that I'm going to talk about today, uh, I thought it was appropriate being at Summer Strong to break it down into more or less building and installing a weight room. So phase one is going to be the blueprint. So setting the foundation, whether it's values and expectations for your staff and the department. Uh, and that's going to be tiers one through five that I covered today. Phase two, construction. So relationships and communication. That's going to be tiers six through eight. Um, and just understanding how we're working from an interdepartmentally standpoint. Uh, and then phase three is going to be the install. So this is where it gets fun with maximizing ideas, weapon weaponizing innovation. That's going to be tiers 9 through 11. So this is going to be looking at things from a thousand foot view of what we're going to cover today. So like I said, blueprint, construction, and install, what all these tiers look like to give an assistant strength coach or assistant director um, that plan and process going from um, that second role to the first big role. So phase one, blueprint. It's going to be extremely important as you enter a new program and take it over that you establish standards and expectations. So first thing you need to do as you go into a program is establish that staff policy manual. So letting everybody know clear and concise expectations for their positions. And um, with that being said, a book, another book that I had read is Good to Great, right? And that gave me a really clear understanding of um, the director prior to me at Mississippi State, I thought he did a good job, 100%, and I wanted to take that piece and take that program to another level, so making it a great program. And in that book, it talks about the flywheel effect. If anybody's seen a K-Box, right, getting that wheel going takes a lot of effort and time, but once you get that wheel going, now you just have to get the right personnel around it to keep that thing rolling and keeping the program going forward. So 
Um, with that being said, next thing we worked into is just the mission statement. So creating objectives of the program. And the staff policy manual and the mission statement was something that I gave to our head of performance uh, administrators. They understand as well where I'm planning to take the program to. Um, the next thing was just the director's philosophy. So what, how am I gonna evaluate my staff? Uh, looking at um, expectations for each role, what responsibilities do they have outside team responsibilities, and making sure they understand that. Um, and then after that, weight room rules. So the one thing with our space is we have eight different teams training out of one weight room. It's not just one team. So we need to have consistency with those weight room rules from whether it's tennis, soccer, volleyball, softball, baseball, all the above. Um, and then as you come into a new program, uh, you need to make sure you meet with HR, of course, for hiring situations and things like that. And then the last thing is just discipline policy. Make sure you share all these different pieces uh, with administrators so they have a good understanding of how you plan to carry out this program. So tier two of Blueprint is gonna be assess staff in the facilities, so SWOT analysis. When I was leaving Clemson, like Beaumont said where we met, um, making that transition to Mississippi State, I knew coming into this situation, a few things that I was gonna have to take on and meet with administration about was first thing, the budget, right? What does this budget look like? Is it shared uh, with football, basketball, baseball? Do we have our own budget? Um, and what do the facilities look like? And the big thing that I, had to do was we had two Olympic facilities at the time and I had to do a SWOT analysis and present it to administration. Um, and with that being said, remodeling of the building was gonna be important, right? And looking at the spaces and talking to them on what my plan was. Um, off of that, breakdown of sports. So like I said, we have eight different sports. Um, and with that, there's of course myself and then I added staff members, like the ones behind me, um, to, to create a, a great understanding of who's gonna fit well with what. Um, and that takes me into staff assignments of each sport. So in our setting, we're dealing with a lot of different personalities, right? So I needed to make sure the personalities of my staff match the sport coaches. And then also based off of that, assigning um, based off of schedules as well. So like, for example, we have, I have volleyball and softball. Volleyball is in season in the fall, and then also um, softball is in season in the spring. So I'm able to travel with both. So making sure that aligns as well. Uh, and then I have a staff of 10 people now. Uh, it's built over time but making sure I assign based off the strength coach's strength, right? So if they've been exposed to a lot of Olympic lifting, putting them with like a track or a volleyball. Uh, if they've been exposed to a lot of field sports, energy system development, making sure, or data science, matching that up as well with some of the GPS tracking and communicating with the sport coaches. So coming into Mississippi State, uh, I, presented, I presented to administration, like I said, and these are a few slides from the presentation that I talked to them about. Um, and the big piece was I knew in my mind that I wanted to centralize these spaces. So you can see there's one rectangle space to one side. That was one Olympic weight room, and then there's like a horseshoe shape. Um, and with that, I got with Phil, and we talked about, hey, what's the plan? What's the process with this? And I knew I wanted to centralize things so we could get verbiage and the coaches all together so I could roll out everything that was my plan. So I talked to them just about coaching practicality and clearly that horseshoe, uh, you can't really see if you're standing on one end of the weight room and you're trying to coach them on the other side, you can't even see them. So I was talking to them about, hey, functionality of that space isn't gonna be all too fantastic, but I still quoted out for administration. If we redid both spaces, how much would that be? And then once they saw that, I'm like, hey, well, how about we take all this money and put it into one space? They were like, okay, you're gonna save us a lot of money. Let's do that. And now I'm able to build out that space and really nice and um, have those eight teams training out of there. And it also centralizes my staff. So it's not only one, one strength coach helping with one sport, there can be three on the floor helping out. So it creates a better quality um, for the student athletes as well. And you're able to do a little bit higher level stuff. Oh, sorry. So in that video, you saw clearly before and after when we renovated the space. We also added that garage door in there because it created um, a really easy way for the student athletes to get in and out of that turf room. So it was a great project that I did, got to do with Phil, wherever he's at. I really, really enjoyed it. So, all right, rolling into 
Uh, tier three, so the performance model, the playbook, and I know a book that became extremely popular over COVID was The Language of Coaching with Nick Winkleman. And this goes along really, really well with kind of how we run things in our space. Uh, so utilizing the same terminology and progressions to be used with all sports, and this allows us uh, in our weight room to really create a holistic approach in a sense of if coaches are on the road traveling, um, us using the same terminology and progressions and language, it's gonna be important as if I have Aaron cover one of my teams when I'm on the road, et cetera. So making sure that that's all aligned with staff synergy and things like that. So it's imperative for transition periods as well. Uh, if we have a strength coach leave and someone else fill in, um, it makes it quite fluent in nature. And then you saw in the video earlier, we talked about creating a training and performance culture based upon core values. So in our space, we do have core values. We give away like a, an award for big dog of the month for a, a male and female team. Uh, they get like a wristband. So they really uh, take a lot of pride in what our core values are for our space. So one thing that I saw extremely valuable when I went on my interview at Mississippi State for the director position was this performance model. And we call it the playbook, right? So administration wants to see that you're organized and have a clear vision for what you're gonna do with the program and department. So you can kind of see some of the different areas that were covered in this performance model and playbook. Um, and then also whenever I went on my interview, like when you're going for a director or a leadership role, I took multiple binders to pass around because you have a lot of round tables that you're interviewing with. So I had to interview with every head coach. That's eight to 10 people that you're gonna be talking with and you need to lay out what your vision is in a short period of time, right? An interview is like one day. So taking this performance model and playbook with me to hand out to them gave them a quicker and better understanding of what my vision was for the program. All right, going into tier four of Blueprint. So build the program from a grassroots approach, uh, our internship program. So it was important as I came into Mississippi State um, this first year to establish and grow a volunteer internship program. Uh, so this allows us for greater individuals of, uh, individualization of training. Uh, it helps with some of our data and analytics standpoint as well. And then it frees up full-time staff members to, to handle other priorities. So, one example of that is we work heavily with our engineering department. So um, if we didn't have interns on, on staff to help out with some of these things and free up time, then they wouldn't be able to go and uh, carry out that. So making sure that you have uh, interns is gonna be crucial. And then also with interns, when they come in and work with you, you have a better understanding of their work ethic, character, all the above. They can also uh, be great candidates for full-time positions down the road. So, for example, when I was at Clemson, both my assistants now at Mississippi State were interns for me at Clemson. So it comes full circle, that candidate pool, and it really is helpful later on. And then the last thing was, we are in Mississippi, so there's not too, too much going on. I'm from Pennsylvania originally, but um, it was important that we created some type of social media presence. So with our Hale State Strength Instagram page, it allowed us, it helped with recruiting big time, so people understand like where we're at, what we're doing, and uh, whether it's assessments or have questions on who's on staff or our uh, positions opening up, we post it on there, and we get a lot of interest. All right, so tier five, integration of technology. Whenever I got to Mississippi State, um, there was literally only Tendo units, and I had been exposed to a high volume of tech prior to when I was at Clemson, because our budget was pretty unlimited. Um, so whenever I went to integrate and introduce a lot of this technology to all the sport coaches, I needed to be extremely detailed and intelligent on how I was gonna do this, so I knew it would be successful. So a few different reasons I talked to the sport coaches of why we wanna integrate technology is to look at making sure that we elicit maximum effort for um, our student athletes on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Along with that, making sure we uh, individualize all aspects of performance training. So utilizing whether it's uh, the gym wares, catapult, force plates, carrying that out in an intelligent manner. And then the last reason is just integrating technology in an effort um, to improve training and impact decision-making on a day-to-day -day basis with our training. So one example of this was whenever we got to Mississippi State, um, within that small period of time, like the first six months when we started to redo the weight room and then leading into the year, um, when we got all the tech on campus and started utilizing it, we made sure that we wanted to keep the coaches up to date with what we were utilizing and doing. So we got everything in, we got it up and running. So we actually had a sports science open house 
Um, so this is an opportunity. It was a week long. Um, literally at noon, the sport coaches could come in. We had coffee and bagels, and we let them utilize the technology, and we spoke about the why behind all the things that we had just purchased because they hadn't been exposed to it. So we needed to let them know why we got it, you know, how they could utilize it with their team and why it would be important for some of that decision-making process. So we broke it down into these different categories, so assessment and monitoring, uh, Analytics, so that's our AMS system. We utilize Coach Me Plus. Some of the training modalities that we use, whether it's the K boxes, the K meter, uh, gym aware units, our partnership with the engineering department on campus. Maybe we don't have as much money as some of the other SEC schools, but we can be intelligent with utilizing uh, some of the MoCap system and some of the stuff we have through the university. And then the last area was load tracking and management, so utilizing Polar Team Pro and or Catapult. So I know I'm going through a lot of tiers today, and I want to make sure that you guys are able to follow along. So I saw it as important to uh, include this roadmap. So this is where we're at. Phase one, we're finishing out Blueprint. Um, usually all these different steps, uh, it's all about values and expectations, right? And the timeline for this was really just year one. We got the weight room built. Uh, we got all the student athletes on the same page with the core values. We got the tech integrated. It's bought. It's ready to go. Um, and now it's really important that success in this phase helps us create that foundation to really push forward. All right, so under construction, phase two. With this phase, I'm gonna talk about just interaction with staff and then the performance team. So my staff in particular, SNC-wise, and then working with nutrition, sports psych, and athletic training. Um, and a few things, my philosophy with interactions with them, of course, is just being clear and direct, right? Everyone can respect that. Going along with that, being organized. Uh, and then the team building model is extremely important. So as you can see um, to the side here, I have another book that I had read, clearly I read a lot, um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I read through this and it really gave me a good understanding of why teams may not work, right? So I wanted to make sure I looked at this triangle uh, was included within the book, this pyramid of different areas that were gonna be important for the staff to be cohesive on and have a great understanding. So a few of our core values being trust uh, within one another and the staff. Um, not having a fear of conflict, right? If we disagree on something, I want to surround myself with people that are going to challenge me. So making sure that we can have clear and concise debates with that. Uh, commitment to the program. So work ethic is important to me, especially after that first year. You really got to grind to get the wheel going, right? And then accountability and results. So we're expected to win. You know, we're in a competitive conference. So how are we going to do that? The next thing with philosophy of inter interaction with the other areas is just lead, don't manage. People really don't like to be micromanaged, right? So it's my job to make sure my personnel and my staff, I'm giving them areas that they can take and run with and take full autonomy. So with that, um, understanding that I'm, a lead, I'm gonna lead them, right? And I'm gonna give them responsibilities that they're gonna be successful with. And then the last thing is just that team of teams model. So you see a lot of pictures of like the hierarchy, right? There's a box here, two underneath, et cetera. Um, really creating that web uh, interconnected to work together. And you can think about it in a sense of, hey, here's the team, whether it's softball, and then there's sports med, sports psych, strength and conditioning, athletic training. We're all working together to create the best product for that team. So continuing with tier six, or yeah, tier six, my apologies, interaction with staff. So um, if you ask these two right here, it's gonna be important that we build trust, like I said, from that pyramid before. And that comes with vulnerability without fear. So being able to talk about what are my strengths and weaknesses, and that comes from the top down. Um, like I said in the last slide too, healthy conflict. So uh, constructive debate. So whether it's like, okay, I have volleyball and I think I should snatch them, but Margo doesn't think so. Hey, let's talk about that and really hash it out. Um, creating staff buy-in. So making sure I'm setting the example from the top down. So making sure that if I'm telling them to read, I'm doing the same thing, which you can see from the bajillion books I have in here, I definitely do. Um, and then giving them a niche or an area of research that interests them. So whether it's return to play, um, any type of tech, looking into that and having them carry that out. And then making sure I care about them as people first. So as I take over the program, getting to know them at a high level. And the last thing is just areas of responsibility outside of team assignments. You have to think about some of these things. So whether they're the intern coordinator, over facility maintenance, um, data analysis, social media, the performance team liaison, they're the one communicating with the other areas, and then research liaison. Like I said, we're working with the engineering department, or for you, maybe exercise science, but getting a clear understanding of how I'm going to interact with them and put them in places that they're going to succeed and grow. 
Uh, and then you see this um, chart over to the side here, uh, our staff meeting. So how is our week laid out? I want to give you guys a really good understanding of what that looks like. So Monday we usually get together, uh, we talk about current issues um, within the department, anything we need to improve upon. Each staff member talks about their area responsibility. And then Wednesdays, uh, we talk about any type of staff continued education. That's our meeting, whatever we're working through at that point in time. And then Fridays, it's usually our uh, staff goal once a month is to reach out to another professional that we, we feel as if we need to grow and learn from. Uh, we also do the interns will do research and present on that, so that's good for them for professional development. And then also we'll do some type of like chalk talk or even a staff lift or a staff meal to continue to grow. All right, so I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this team of teams model. Uh, and this is an example, actually, that Aaron made of an assessment profile for our student athletes, what that looks like, and then how we work together with some of these different areas. So coming in, this is year two, right, with the construction piece. Uh, it's going to be important that getting with sports med, and we've added all this tech, uh, what do our assessments look like now? And how can we integrate and work together with them, whether it's collaborating on any type of readiness testing or return to play? How can we do this at a higher level? Uh, and then also injury reports, does that look the same across all eight teams or a little bit different between uh, the different teams? And then going into nutrition and sports psych with the team of teams model, looking at with nutrition as I'm coming in, getting a better understanding of do they have a structured education in place? Um, do they have some type of curriculum or is it kind of all over the place? What teams does uh, sports nutrition work with consistently or what teams they're not really exposed to? How can I make that better? An example is like, we had a team that they weren't working with at all, and I was giving them 10 minutes at the beginning of lift or the end of lift to get with them, because I see it as a highly valued area. And then the last thing is just sports psych. How are we integrating and working with them? Uh, and with that, we'll talk with them as well, kind of similar to sports nutrition of, hey, what teams are you involved with, and how can we help out in that regard? And what's your relationship like with the sport coaches? Because I think a lot of the time uh, with them, it turns into there's a stigma attached to sports psych, and how can I help trump that or bridge that gap? Another thing that we started to do with sports psychology was building big dogs. We are bulldogs at Mississippi State, and it was like lunchtime learning. So once a month, we got on Zoom, and we did some type of presentation to show them, hey, this is what sports psych has to offer, whether well, there's different meetings with their teams, just educating the sport coaches on some of these different pieces. All right, continuing on to tier seven for construction, our operating system. So when I got to Mississippi State, um, we were clearly, if you look at this chart, this is in 2018, um, we were at the bottom of the conference from a student athlete to coach ratio. So this was something that I wanted to make sure we established staff responsibilities and delivered it to admin. And in regards to this, we wanted to find ways to add positions. So doing your homework so they have a better understanding of kind of where we fall, because if you go into them and just ask for more positions, you're probably not gonna get them. You need to have a clear understanding of why we need them and where we fall. So after presenting this to them, you'll see on the next slide the responsibilities, but we were able to add two assistants and then also two paid interns to our staff. So we doubled in size that year too when I was there at Mississippi State, um, just based off of going to administration with a plan. And then the last thing is, it's gonna be important to uh, have that holistic model of whether it's verbiage and things like that, because you have to realize within our space, and with football a little bit too, of course, but we have low salaries, there's burnout at a high level from traveling, so, and then also people wanna speed up their career trajectory, so making sure that you centralize everyone into one space and using that same language, because you'll probably have people going in and out. So this is just a quick example of responsibilities uh, within our staff going from me as the director and then assistants, volunteer interns, professional interns, and our GA, what the responsibilities are, and this was something that we shared with administration after we added the positions. Of course, my oversight, the head of performance, to have a better understanding of, yeah, we've added these positions and this is how they're carrying out the responsibilities as well. All right, another extremely important area to have a good and strong relationship with is administration. So what we do is we make sure we keep them in the loop with all major decision making, uh, so because they're a very helpful ally, right? So whether it's our budget plan, what that looks like for our five-year plan, whether we're adding technology or staffing, building out sports science and adding positions, uh, making sure that we keep them in line and in tune. An example of that is when we were looking at um, getting an AMS system, right? Any meetings that we had, say uh, Smartabase comes in, we uh, created an itinerary, all right? When Smartabase comes on campus, we'll make sure they meet with administration first, our CFO, our AD, then meet with sports med, sports psych, meet with the sport coaches, so they can get an understanding of how they can all utilize this piece of tech. 
Um, and another example is the fatigue science, the whoop bands. Um, in the past, we had a donor pay for those. Um, having actually the sport coaches administration wear those for like a week, so they have a better understanding of what our student athletes are utilizing. So it's really just based off of you getting extremely creative. All right, so the sport coaches, we deal with them a lot, right, as strength coaches, and we're there to help them. So making sure you build strong relationships with the sport coaches is gonna be extremely important. So when you come in, your initial meeting, what should that look like? Um, first thing is, of course, supply them with weight room rules and also your core values. And um, then based off of that, then you have conversations about, all right, well, what are your core values for your teams and how can I help out with that and speak the same language? And then going beyond that, sometimes sport coaches have some type of stigma towards strength coaches, right? Asking them how their relationships were in the past with their other strength coaches so you can get a better understanding of where they're coming from with certain conversations you may have with them. Next thing is be present at their practices and games. You know, show that you care outside of just the weight room. And also with that, developing a detailed understanding of the style of play that each team employs. They're a high press team, making sure that you uh, figure out what their style of play is and how you can help out with that in the conditioning aspect of your job. Uh, the next thing is gonna be present regularly at head coaches council. And this is, I touched on it slightly, the building big dogs piece. Uh, we do like the learning at lunch uh, with the Zoom and figuring out like one thing that we presented on, I'll show in the next slide, is just different areas that we work together on from an SNC standpoint and marrying practice and how we should work towards game day. Um, and then also another thing that we do in the summertime as kids come on campus is our onboarding program. So each uh, performance area, they get with all the freshmen that come in, they talk about, all right, sports psych, what is your role with the team? Nutrition, uh, how can you help out? And then us talking about our ground zero program with the freshmen and then athletic training, maybe recovery modalities that they do. Making sure that we're educating the student athletes at a high level and they understand what our role is within the program. The next thing is going to be knowing your situation, right? So it's your job as the strength coach to understand the head coach, uh, what they value, their mindset. Are they open to experimenting? Are they not? Are they extremely closed-minded? And then also, what is their he what's the head coach's relationship with some of their assistants on, camp or on their staff? Is there an assistant that's highly influential, you know, that you can kind of backdoor and take ideas to them, and they can take it to the head coach? Um, understanding how that works. And then the last one's going to be um, with the student athletes, uh, what's the coach's relationship with them? Is it a coach-athlete relationship? Is it a top-down culture? Uh, is it a player-driven culture? Or getting a better understanding of your situation in that regard. The last thing with the sport coach is just make sure you uh, scope the scene, right? So understand the team's history when you come into the program. Are they historically a top five program? Are they kind of a cellar dweller? Where do they fall in that regard? So you can best understand and speak to the team and speak to the coaches in regards to if it's a top five team, it's gonna be one thing. If they're more at the bottom, it's gonna be more process driven. So this is just a quick example, actually, of a presentation that Aaron, my assistant, put together for our sport coaches for some of these learning at lunches opportunities. So morphocycle development. Uh, and leading up to an undulating match and making sure it complements with the weight room well. Also using historical data in sessions to plan out practice so we know the, the exact response. And we got this idea from one of our continued education sessions on a Wednesday. We were watching a Strength Coach Network and Nick DeMarco was touching on this a little bit, so credit to him with this presentation that we put on for our sport coaches and administration. All right, continuing construction, uh, tier eight, building strong relationships with sports performance and the engineering department, which I touched on a little bit before. But some quick ideas, quick hitters that we've done is with the performance team, we've created like a stall seat journal. So when you go in the bathroom, there's a quick, quick hit and miss of some different uh, education pieces from all the different su support staff areas. And then um, also we created some type of performance newsletter that we send out to administration once a month of what we're doing with the student athletes, what we're doing with the coaches, what we have to offer, all the above, and they understand actually what our job is on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, also, the engineering department, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, one of our softball players, some of the testing that we do, some of the research. We really try to capitalize with resources with working with them. So whether it's research in the summer, we're doing with the aura ring to look at validity, but also our student athletes get to wear them as well. Um, but really partnering with them and using them as a huge ally on campus. Another piece that we've looked into is also um, partnering, them with, partnering with them to host conferences because they'll split the cost. So how can you be intelligent and use them as an ally, whether it's with any type of tech that you may want to buy and or conferences that you want to host, and then also um, using them uh, to present to administration on some of the research that you're working on so they know what you're doing even outside of the weight room. 
So here are some quick examples of the Athlete Engineering Summit we're looking to put on uh, with the, the engineering department, some of the research that we've done, uh, the sports performance newsletter that Margo, my graduate assistant, put together, and then also that stall seat journal that when you sit down in the stall, you can learn a little something. All right, so let's harness the, this in. Uh, where are we at? So we're at the end of phase two, construction. Remember, this is all about relationships, communication, like I said, with all these different areas. And this should be fully implemented by the end of year two. So we've gone through year one, the foundation. We're on to, to year two, uh, looking at making sure that we've built out these relationships and communicate well and at a high level. Uh, we're ready to roll into phase three. All right, phase three, install. So tier nine, making staff development a priority. And I've touched on this a little bit, and this is why you guys are here, right? You want to learn. So one thing that we do uh, once a month is call a professional and talk to them about what they know. And this allows us to build our network for mainly our unpaid interns, our paid interns, our graduate assistants. They need to continue to build out their network, get to know people. Um, so hopefully later on, one, they can get jobs. And then also, two, uh, they have people to rely on and call back on if they have questions, comments, concerns, other than just myself. Um, and Wednesdays, this is when... Uh, the staff continue education piece, and I'll show a few different examples of what we've worked through for our staff continue education, but um, making sure that we have a relentless pursuit for knowledge, because that's one of our staff core values, uh, being consistent with that. And then another example is just one time a month. Uh, the interns will present on different topics, like I said, and that also makes us better, saves me time because I'm quite busy. Then they also learn from it as well. So whether it's different research projects or anything I'm looking to invest in, looking at reliability and validity with those. And then the chalk talk. So getting up on the board and just asking questions, because this is something a lot of the time that you see on interviews, right? So really preparing them for um, having those healthy debates and being able to get up and just freelance and think out loud. And then the last thing is just my job as the director of our program is to make sure that we're developing and educating my staff on a daily basis. So when they come in, they're going to be here. And when they leave, they've really pushed the envelope and learned a lot. So here's some information that you guys can take and run with. So these are some of the examples of what we've done on Wednesdays for continuing ed over the last year. So whether it's Altus Need for Speed, uh, David Gray Rehab and Speedworks are both uh, companies that are overseas and like Ireland and the UK. Uh, Art of Coaching, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And then a couple online resources are Strength Coach Network and Complementary Training. They're always throwing up whether it's different articles or presentations, and then, of course, Cressy, some of his stuff as well. And then I know Cal is in the house somewhere, but triphasic, triphasic training, uh, the speed manual, because our student athletes in our weight room, we have rotational athletes, we have field sports, so we have to be able to really touch on a few different things and be well-rounded. So tier 10, integration of sports science. So I think sport coaches have really developed a stigma towards sports science to a certain degree. So what they think sports science is versus what it actually is is completely different. And that's why I kind of have this funny mug here and also someone like doing research um, in a lab, but really understanding why we use some of these sports science pieces and technology. So understanding data drives conversations and conversations drive decisions. So in this next clip, I'm gonna show a video of some of the different pieces of technology we utilize at State. And then this is also something that we put together because this last year was, has been quite strange with COVID. So um, giving our recruits also a better understanding of how we carry out assessment protocols too. Here in Shire Weight Room, it's a world-class facility. It's fantastic because it's centralized within all the athletic facilities, almost like an Olympic village. Our weight room is 7,000 square feet with a garage door that leads out to a 50-yard indoor turf facility. We have 12 of the Sornex XL Series rack and a half, which equal 24 platforms. All racks and accessories are personalized with the Mississippi State logo. When coming in here, we really cultivate a family atmosphere. It's definitely a huge piece of all of the team's cultures because there's a lot of accountability in here along with energy and passion. It's very unique because it's not only your individualized strength coach helping with the team, but there's usually three or four strength coaches helping on the floor. In Shire Weight Room, we really like to empower the student athletes by educating them with skill sets that will benefit them beyond the CPC. We like to create a high performance environment through screening, tracking, and testing to maximize athletic potential. 
So when an athlete arrives here at Mississippi State, we take all of our athletes through a full assessment so that when we get to actually creating their strength conditioning programs, it caters to that individual as specifically as possible. A lot of different things that we can use to assess our athletes. The force frame is a device that we can use to isometrically test a lot of different types of movements or muscle groups. Force plates are one of the most versatile tools that we have in the weight room. We do a series of jump testing, hop testing, balance. Another thing that we have is our contact grid where we look at the reactive strength of our athletes' lower limbs. So the Nord board measures our athletes' hamstring strength and bilateral asymmetry or the difference between their left and right legs. Gym Wears are another training tool that we utilize here in the weight room. It's a velocity-based training tool that actually measures the bar speed of a lot of the different main movements that we'll use. The last piece of equipment that we have is Holer Team Pro. Uh, this wearable technology allows us to actually track movements, heart rates, distances, high-speed running outside of the weight room or in conditioning sessions as well. We look forward to working with you in Shira Weight Room and you joining the Bulldog family. Hail State. All right, so I hope that gives you guys a better understanding of the ins and outs of our weight room, what we use to test and do assessment with. So why integrate sports science? And I think this is a question that we get a lot of time from our sport coaches. Of what are your thoughts? Why do we need to use this stuff? And they want to learn more about it. They're just wondering why. So a few different points that I tell them, it's to answer questions, right? And then also to ask better questions about our training or whether it's strength training on the field, all the above, and then also to discover new questions as well. So our philosophy at Mississippi State is we look at sports science as a feedback loop. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is just collecting all this data. Like you saw, all the different pieces that we utilize, uh, making sure that we collect it, whether it's subjective data or objective data. And then that leads well into analyzing it. So whether you're importing this into some type of AMS system or um, Tableau, Power BI, all the above, looking at analyzing it, norms, uh, thresholds, and trends. Then from there, working around the feedback loop, making adjustments, right? So whether it's increase, decrease, alternate training loads, taking us into the last one, which would be implementation. So if we need to uh, change training, look at competition, uh, make altercations, and then some of the recovery modalities will work with sports med. But the big thing that I tell the sport coaches is the point of using some of these uh, tech pieces is to make data-informed decisions not data-driven decisions. So making sure that aligns well when we're utilizing this feedback loop. So one thing that we gave the sport coaches as we kind of moved along and added more and more pieces to the puzzle was we gave them these binders uh, to keep in their offices in a sense of, if they're talking with a recruit on the phone, um, hey, what do you guys have? We gave them this binder, and these are a few different pieces out of the binder, whether it's from a movement standpoint, energy system, they can always rely on this. Um, to look back and have that information to whenever they're picking up phone calls or talking with other coaches, letting them know what we utilize, um, and they're really buying into the tech as well. And then we also include some future additions, so if it's something that we need to talk to donors about, the sport coaches are aware and can kind of get the right people organized and in front of us. All right, so... With tier 10, integration of sports science, now it's time to collect. So what do we collect? Uh, and at the end of the day, you need to look at metrics that matter. So don't just collect data to collect it, right, and have all these numbers just floating in space. It's our job as strength coaches to identify KPIs for each sport. Like I said, we have multiple sports training at our space, so it looks a little bit different for everybody. But establishing these norms and KPIs and not waiting for those severe outliers, trying to make interventions before that. With that being said, this is just an example, actually, my assistant Aaron put in a presentation of whenever we're pulling these CSVs out of the technology, you're going to see a mixture of data, right? And it's our job as strength coaches to filtrate the residue, pull that out, and really give them the data that matters, um, whether it's in your performance reports that you send to them on a, a daily basis, weekly basis, all the above. So collect, like I said, metrics that matter. And what sport coaches want to know is how are you going to keep my players healthy, right? So what metrics lead into certain, um, whether it's injuries, how are they linked, all the above. So we kind of gave them a cheat sheet of like, all right, when you're looking at high speed running on a report, how does that overlay uh, looking at hamstring injuries? Decelerations also, whether it's a, a knee, hip, or groin injury, um, a high volume of jumps with a basketball or a volleyball, um, looking at any type of like knee or patella injury that you may have. 
um, swings. Like I said, we have a lot of rotational sports, tennis, volleyball, golf, all the above. That can lead into uh, oblique or low back or SI injuries. And then the last one, of course, just like including weight room volume as well. So here's a quick example of just KPIs for all of our sports that we have in our weight room. So this has been helpful, um, not only for us as an SNC staff, but also sending to our performance department. So sending it to our athletic trainers, so they have a better understanding because they're covering all these different sports. Um, sports psych, what are they looking at and how can they speak the, the language a little better with the sport coaches of what some of these reports mean. Um, but really looking at each sport, and this has been extremely beneficial. We do have interns from the engineering department that help out with us. We call them athlete engineering interns. And we give this to them as well because they love all the numbers, but they have to figure out what numbers actually matter in some of these reports. So being able to educate them in a sense of what metrics are important and then educating them on also like what's used across the board at the bottom as well. So analyze, what are we looking at? So the biggest thing is, of course, we're analyzing towards competition demands. So whether it's average volumes, average work rates, uh, looking at the worst case scenario in a game, like highest meters per minute, and making sure we're preparing the student athletes for some of these metrics that we're gonna see. That's on a, a team level. Then individually, some of the variability that we're gonna see is whether it's positional demands, physical capabilities, looking at style of play, and also the competition variability. We all dealt with some different stuff this past year with COVID, having to play like back-to-back -back games, or I know we went through a period with softball or baseball, we played 10 games in 12 days, looking at that competition variability and how are we gonna adjust practice volumes and also weight room volumes to make sure that we're creating the best situation for our student athletes. All right, so integration of sports science. What are we analyzing? I know uh, Tim Gavitt's put out a lot of great research that we've looked into in a sense of, all right, what are factors that influence acute to chronic workload ratios and that tolerance? So, of course, relative strength's gonna be important and then also strength to body weight, but diving a little bit deeper into some of these ratios, so looking at rate of accumulation. Um, so whether that's training load, XLs, D cells, jumps, whatever you're measuring with your team, um, making sure you look at the acute, the fatigue, and then also that chronic, the fitness piece. Next thing we're gonna look at is that high speed running. So what's their max speed? Uh, so what's their highest sprint velocity capability? Because each student athlete's gonna be a little bit different when it comes to their bandwidth. The last area we look at is that aerobic capacity, so their fitness. So what's their gas tank look like um, when we're looking at some of these different uh, numbers and metrics? So working into and working around that feedback loop, uh, looking at adjusting. So what are we gonna do on our end? Because you almost wanna collect all these numbers and not do anything with it. And I think that's one area that people sometimes struggle with. So how are you gonna adjust? So looking at reducing practice loads, uh, topping off reserves, so student athletes that aren't playing all too much, um, altering playing time accordingly if you have like a midweek game and then you play all weekend and our recovery strategies. So whether it's Normatec boots, float tanks, when to install this, cryo, when to utilize this throughout the week that you're gonna get the most out of your kids. So I saw it as extremely important to create and uh, show you guys a real world example of what this looks like with one of our teams. So this is a softball example because I work with them. So it's our job to first, like I said, collect. So whether this is their game and practice polar data, uh, doing the jump testing on the contact grid for RSI, they utilize these blast sensors that go on the bottom of their bats looking at uh, exit velo, rotational acceleration, and also using that subjective data from their, their wellness questionnaire going off of collecting and working into analyzing. So analyzing that load for the starters versus the reserves that who aren't playing, um, and also looking at fatigue trends uh, throughout, because you'll create the baseline, let's say in the fall, and then we're in season in the spring, and then making adjustments from there. Uh, and then, of course, adjustments. So what does that look like in action? So some of the things that we've done, of course, is increase sprint and XL and D-cell for the bench, uh, or limit for the starters, so on the flip side of things. Uh, the last portion of that feedback loop, right, is gonna be implementation. So um, some things that we've done is, let's say no base running for, for some of our starters in practice, or adding a, a sprint workout after BP on Fridays for the bench. Or another one we've done is just uh, adding a lift after BP on a Saturday for the bench. So these are just kind of based off of your creativity and what's gonna fit your schedule at your school. 
All right, on the flip side of this, I think it's important, like not all schools, or maybe you're in a high school realm, you may not have that much money to have a, a GPS system, right? So how do you develop a feedback loop without GPS? And we're gonna roll through that here. So it's gonna be important to collaborate on some of these sports-specific data. So like I said, we use the blast sensors on the bottom of our bats for softball. What data can you collect from your sport coach that they seem necessary? Or meet times for track, right? Or time trials that you're doing. Establishing and collaborating with your sport coach on some of those different pieces. That leads into uh, establishing standardized and repeatable readiness tests. So what are you able to do on a weekly basis? And an example with like golf that we do is they jump on the force plates and then we look at club head speed. How are these correlating? Some of the simplest metrics or uh, some of the, the simplest metrics that you can look at. Um, also with the repeatable test, we'll do like the contact grid, like I said, and then the groin squeeze on the force frame as you can see in the picture. And then that leads into collecting and analyzing the wellness questionnaires, which you can do on like, you know, any, any of the simplest platforms, you know, create that Google Docs, or if you have some type of AMS system that you're utilizing, using, going through that. And then the last thing I think is just super important is being patient and starting small. So if you have a sport coach that's never used any type of tech, you need to start with maybe one thing that you know that consistently works, because a lot of the time they get frustrated, like, oh, this only works 50% of the time. Make sure you get with something, start small, and build momentum, like I said. So where are we at? Uh, we're at the end of phase three, and that's actually currently where I'm at within my career. We're at the end of year three at Mississippi State, and it's all about innovation and ideas and getting creative, and that's where some of these sports science pieces came from, talking with different professionals across the country of what they're doing and how it's gonna fit to our model uh, and make it scalable. So we fully integrated things, um, we've built through the foundation, we have relationships, and now we're pushing the envelope with some of that research and uh, the sports science and adding more positions off of that as well. So we've worked through all three phases. Tier 11 is we're open for business, right? The install's done, people are ready to come in the door. So my big thing that I want you guys to be able to leave today is going through all those tiers and organizing it the way I did, uh, understanding and creating that framework for a high performance model. If you do get the opportunity to make that jump, right? Assistant to director, you have that framework in place and understanding of working through blueprint, construction, and then install. So creating that clear and concise playbook um, for making the jump is gonna be key. And then of course, innovation ideas is based off and kind of up to you beyond that. But continuing to move the needle forward and I think creating worth for yourself just outside of training the kids in the weight room, whether it's like I said, getting with administration to do presentations for higher ups or working with the engineering department to create research, to create a better product is gonna be extremely important. And then as I go throughout my career, just surrounding myself with personnel that are gonna challenge me and my thought processes too. So bringing it all home, of course, I want to thank Sorenex for having me. Uh, thank my staff for always being there because I couldn't be there without or be here without them. And um, if you guys would like, because I know I went through a lot today, uh, a copy of this presentation, just please let me know. And of course, I have to include some social media on here in a way for you guys to reach out to me. So uh, thank you so much.